Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. All right, welcome back, everybody. Half past on a Monday. That means it's time for our dose of science with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. How are you doing, Dr. Mitch? Having a great day. You know, I got to tell you, you uh, reached out and touched me uh, over the weekend. I, I took a friend to go to Powell's House of Books and touring around a... It, Powell's is just this block-sized bookstore that's three stories tall and rounded a corner and right there on the end cap was... Uh, on the end cap there was pop politics. So I, I took a picture of myself with it just to prove it. Oh, great. Actually, I haven't been to Powell's in a couple of years, but last time I went ahead and signed uh, the, the pot politics that was in there. So... I, I hope that copy is no longer there. Oh, yeah. I'll have to take a look and, and find out. Uh, speaking of Powell's, by the way, folks, uh, tomorrow, Doug Fine, the author of Too High to Fail, is going to be at Powell's Bookstore. I'm going to go out there and get some uh, film and interview with him, so maybe I'll see you out there. All right, I actually wrote a review of that for American Psychological Association. It's a wonderful book. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, that's great. All right. Uh, I encourage anyone to check that book out, Too High to Fail. There's a there's a link out on theweedblog.com. If you check out there in their top right corner, you can get a copy. All right. Um, with Dr. Mitch, we always take your questions in the chat room. If you put the uh, Q colon by it, it makes it easier for us to find it. Um, also, we got our phone lines open at 971-533-7111. But we always let Dr. Mitch have the first word and let us know what's the latest in cannabis science. Yes, a new article in the journal Biblioteca uh, talks about the uses of hemp in Pakistan. Pakistan is in a situation where they really need as much uh, biodiverse fuel as possible. And these authors essentially walk through how hemp could really help their resources there. And it need not be psychoactive. As we've mentioned before, there are uh, strains of hemp that are less than 1.5% THC. You'd have to smoke a whole field in order to get high. Uh, but it's a wonderful plant that's extremely efficient, easy on the environment, and could actually uh, be a, a great source of biodiesel there in, in the Middle East and, of course, here in the United States as well. Absolutely. Just just switching over our diesel trucks, you know, the long-haul truckers over to, to hemp biodiesel alone would do so much for our environment. I, I'm glad that you brought up the hemp because that leads me to an article that we had covered, a story we'd covered a couple of weeks ago. And I uh, didn't get a chance to ask you about it, but I thought this was amazing and, and what it could do for uh, American medicine. And this was a story on a study. Uh, it was the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. And it was a study showing that hemp fabric kills bacteria, including MRSA. And wow, what a difference that would make in our hospitals. It's funny because this actually goes back at least to the 1950s, and there's some conjecture about uh, why certain uh, ancient peoples were actually buried in hemp. So, yeah, we do see this wild antibacterial effect even in uh, the hemp fiber, and so that would be really adaptive. Obviously, it's not as strong as hardcore antibacterials, but then, of course, it's not as uh, difficult to deal with in the long run. And with both MRSA and C. diff going rampant in hospitals right now, I feel like this would be a nice, inexpensive way to intervene. Yeah, and this was a 60% hemp, 40% rayon, so it wasn't even full uh, hemp. And they found they just put it on uh, scrubs and lab coats and the, the drapes between the patients. And, and there's some 2 million Americans that get MRSA in the hospital every year, and 90,000 people that die from it far more than ever died from cannabis, of course. Uh, so, yeah, this is an amazing find. I hope we can do something with this. All right, uh, let me get to a question from the chat room. I had a couple of others that I want to get to as well, but I want to make sure our chatters are getting their questions in. And this one uh, comes from, here we go, uh, Runaround666, who wants to know, what do you think about that study that just got some ink lately saying long-term cannabis use makes us lazy? The curious thing about this is, of course, it's, it's uh, even in the longitudinal data, not randomly assigned. So as I used to joke on the stages at uh, the comedy store in Los Angeles, it's not that cannabis makes people lazy. It's that once you decide you're going to be lazy, cannabis sounds like fun. <laughs> there, there we go. Uh, not uh, all cannabis smokers are lazy, but some lazy people smoke cannabis. Exactly. Uh, Trickster Phillips wanted to know if we could talk about the Queensland Brain Institute study on cannabis and schizophrenia, and I don't know if I caught this one. Uh, I mean, the, the clincher is this is just one in a, in a whole series, and 
What has happened, unfortunately, is this schizophrenia cannabis link has become reified, and so they put people in the horrible MRI machine and give them THC by itself, no cadabidiol, and what a surprise, they have various paranoid or psychotic experiences. Well, we know for a fact that THC by itself would do that to anyone, and thank God the uh, the plant doesn't have to have THC and THC alone, so that would certainly be helpful if we could actually use whole plant in these studies. But uh, in fact, a lot of the data on THC and schizophrenia, or at least cannabis use in schizophrenia, doesn't seem to replicate, and unfortunately that never gets the media attention that we want. So Timmy Moffat, who I love, who found a basically a, a double genetic risk Folk, set of folks who were heavily involved with cannabis early in life were more likely to develop schizotypia, sort of schizophrenia light. But once uh, another group tried to find the same thing, they couldn't find it. What a surprise that failure to replicate got no media coverage, whereas Timmy Moffat's thing got a ton. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, another story that caught my eye, this was in the weed blog as well. Cannabis compound reduces cigarette consumption in tobacco smokers. Uh, so is it possible that smoking weed can lead you away from smoking cigarettes? I have literally been receiving emails about this since 2002, and I always thought, oh, it's just smoke is smoke, or maybe there's something about the sensation of smoke going down your lungs that helps ease the pain or something like that. But this is much more focused on cannabinoid receptors themselves and the tendency to essentially soothe discomfort, alleviate distress more generally, and the distress associated with nicotine withdrawal does seem to be alleviated under these circumstances. I'm apprehensive about this and at least want to <laughs> encourage folks to lean on their vaporizer rather than alternative uh, ways of smoking if they're going to use this approach. But by all means, anything that can get you off those nasty cigarettes is bound to be good. All right. Uh, we have such great questions from our chat room. Randy Brush in our chat room has this one. Uh, does cannabis have any effect on lead in removal from the body, air, or soil? Uh, does cannabis help remove lead? So this is, this is a controversial issue and one that I, I've been asked before. And at least when you look at uh, some of the agricultural literature, it does look like cannabis is... Uh, drawing lead out of the soil, but of course then we don't really want that in cannabis that we're going to smoke. <laughs> so you can imagine if you've got some lead-laced uh, soil, growing a bunch of hemp plants in there and hoping it takes them out of there, but then certainly not using them uh, pharmacologically, maybe using them for hemp or something like that, because we don't want that lead ending up in our own lungs. Okay. A follow-up question he has is to ask your opinion, and I've never heard of using this, so you might have to explain it to me, uh, your opinion on using calcium bentonite clay for bong water to remove metals. So the, the clincher was, uh, <laughs> this bentonite was, was actually one of those things that people were sort of using when they were fasting and looking at how it went through your system and stuff like that. There actually isn't a lot of compelling evidence uh, that it that it absorbs anything novel, that it does anything different from, say, standard uh, psyllium fiber or other sources of fiber. So until we have better data, I, I can't say one way or another. Uh, there is at least one published case study, too, where somebody kind of overdid it on this and ended up with some serious GI problems. So this is this is not a toy. We don't need to eat clay if we don't have to. There's some follow-up in, in the chat on this about the use of screens. Uh, people smoking through a bong perhaps would use a metal screen to keep the material from falling through. And I've heard of people using different types of screens, glass screens, and different types of metals. What can you tell us about the use of screens and how they might affect us? It's sad that there aren't more data on this. But the, the problem really is, uh, I'm, I mean, everybody's heard my vaporizer soapbox, and that would be, of course, my first choice. But anytime you heat metal certain ions are formed and that's going to definitely come off. Now some of those are not going to be filtered through water but then we have a less efficient administration of uh, the cannabinoids in the first place so it gets it gets really complicated. If, if you can afford a vaporizer I really recommend it. Uh, otherwise in, in truth we just don't have any data on one screen versus another. Yeah and uh, just to add here it says that he's burning through uh, screens Pretty quickly, that uh, could be that you're using a torch lighter, which is you know not very good for smoking cannabis with anyway, because you boil off certain cannabinoids before they are effective. But uh, you really you really don't need that much heat to to make good use of the plant. Yeah, good point. 
All right, uh, let's see here. Uh, we are live, by the way, here on 420radio.org, but if you don't get a chance to get your question answered or you're just shy and want to ask it privately, you can go to our contact form, 420radio.org slash contact, or click the links from the front page. There's a drop-down for Ask Dr. Mitch. We can send the questions that way, or you can do it directly through email to 420research at gmail.com. Uh, there was another story, and this one comes from Fox News, so I took it with a salt lick. Um, but it said, chronic cannabis use may cause brain inflammation. Uh, any note on brain inflammation? <gasps> As it turns out, this is a misinterpretation of some data that were gathered years ago, suggesting that heavy cannabis use early in life changes the ratio of white to gray matter. And it was uh, true only in one really small sample. It has not replicated. I, I, you know, certainly am not a fan of heavy use of cannabis early in life. So by all means, we already knew that that wasn't a great idea. But the idea that this actually inflames uh, neurons makes no sense, given what we know about uh, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects of the cannabinoids. We have another question from Randy Brush, which uh, I, I don't know if there's any... Uh, e use in the answer but it kind of interesting trivia what's bigger in a human the cannabinoid receptor or a brain cell uh, what's funny is the receptor itself is just a small uh, set of literally molecules on the end of a brain cell on, on the end of the neuron itself and they're only present in some nerves and not in others uh, fortunately that's the ones that are associated with euphoria with appetite and with memory and uh, obviously the ones in the periphery in the, in the uh, immune system are outside the spinal cord, outside the brain itself. So it's, it's an intriguing thing to think that the plant and our bodies have evolved this way. All right. Time for one last question from Reefer Rob. Wants to know, how effective is cannabis in the process of neurogenesis? We, we don't have a ton of evidence about, say, smoked cannabis itself, but we're getting really encouraging things from... Uh, some labs in Ohio with both THC and cannabidiol uh, helping along the neurogenesis process. It's not a panacea yet. It's not the cure for Alzheimer's uh, for folks who already have it, but it certainly has some amazing neuroprotective effects that are antioxidants uh, similar to a lot of other plants. I can't say it's the lone and only one, but definitely an impressive uh, set of data. All right. Well, that's all the time we have today for our Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. We do this every Monday, so if you missed out at the beginning, just uh, come on back next Monday. We'll do it again or listen to the replay that comes up in just three hours from now. Dr. Mitch, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Have a great show. And John Thomas, we'll get your question next week on that. That's an interesting one on the vapor pens. Coming up next, we got time for a radical rant. Going to talk about the influence of Mexican cartels right here in Oregon. <laughs>